Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. Today, I'm joined by Fessy Sataki, BYU's passing game coordinator and wide receivers coach to discuss seventh round draft pick Dax Milne. I guarantee you'll want to pay closer attention to Milne after listening to Sataki. It's not just that he's high on his guy, it's the reasons why. I still think Milne faces an uphill battle to make the 53-man roster, but he's someone worth watching how he develops over the next year. As always, I will remind you that you can read my work on ESPN.com. You can follow me also on Instagram at John Kine ESPN. As for ESPN.com, I have a story up now about how Washington's offense is much improved and why. Do me a favor and give the podcast a rating on Apple or wherever you can. It's a big help. And don't forget about the daily fantasy site, monkeyknifefight.com. You get a free $5 game plus a match deposit of up to $100. Just use promo code JKR. Before I play my conversation with Fessy Sataki, here are a couple of nuggets of information. On Chase Young and Montez Sweat. The one guy I would not worry about missing time is Chase Young. I do think being a team leader, it would be good for him to be there. That's what the coaches feel. But what I know about Young and what they know and have heard all offseason is how much work he's doing. He knows what he needs to do. That's the last guy I'd worry about in that regard. And Sweat will do what Young is doing. They're, they're pretty tight. And, and Sweat has certainly adopted um, some of, at least at least some, maybe all, or a lot of, Young's habits. There have been times in the past I'd worry about a certain guy not showing up, but typically this means nothing once training camp begins or even mini camp. What matters is during Sundays, are you prepared and do you produce? I know coaches want, they also want guys to take their offseason seriously and come into camp in shape and prepared. My understanding is that Young and Sweat have both talked to their coaches and they have the installs as far as what Washington has been doing during these workouts. If a guy doesn't produce, then it's time to worry about things. When they have the mandatory, mandatory mini camps, they'll, he'll be there as will sweat, as I, again, as I would expect sweat to be as well. But the team has had excellent attendance during the spring. Now, they often had it under Jay Gruden as well, so that doesn't always equate to anything during the season. Injuries and quarterback play kind of matter at that point. However, I do think it says something that in a time when the NFLPA wants players to not attend – and when a lot of teams have had many stay away, that Washington has had only a couple guys miss. I do think it speaks to what they're trying to build here. Along with that, because it's been so good and because Ron Rivera was so pleased with what he saw from guys while here, he eliminated one week of the OTA work and moved up the mini camp. So they're going to end the mini camp at June 10th rather than June 17th. The desire during the spring is to get through the install and they will accomplish that in nine sessions. This goes back to what I talked about on the other podcast, the previous one, and the benefit of having experienced quarterbacks in the league and in the system. It allows you to practice differently, get through more things, and therefore complete your install in better and quicker fashion. I also think it speaks to Rivera having a pulse on the players. One of the things, he's not sitting there in the, in the defensive meeting rooms and, and scheming with Jack Del Rio. That's not what he does. So it's, I always kind of laugh when people talk about this being a Rivera defense, it's a Jack Del Rio defense and it always has been. But one thing that Rivera does really well is he kind of, he serves, he's the overseer. He is the CEO of this organization. He is the face of the franchise, but he has a big picture approach with these players. And I think it's why guys respond to him that this is a way to reward them. And it's, you know, a lot of teams sometimes would cut off a day at the end of minicamp, so you get an extra day. Getting an extra week is is a big reward at this time of the year and going into training camp. Um, so I think it's something that guys will appreciate, and we'll see where it goes. And, it's again, it's a reward for what they consider their effort. One position group that will be interesting to watch all summer is the receivers. As of now, you'd expect Kerry McLaurin, Curtis Samuel, Deami Brown, and Adam Humphreys to be on the roster. I'm also putting Cam Sims, Cam Sims on there because I know how much they liked his finish in 2020. And they also want some definite size on the outside. And he certainly provides that. After that, we'll see if they keep one or two more. That would give them six or seven. 
But you have a group of Antonio Gandy Golden, Kelvin Harmon, Isaiah Wright, and Steven Sims, and Dax Milne. AGG and Milne are their draft picks, and that always matters. But AGG had better show a lot more than he did last summer. Again, injuries disrupted his development, and they, you know, and I, and then he just never quite got into anything. So this is, will be a, a big summer for him to show more of what he can do. Um, I know they're intrigued by Harmon's physical play, and I do think Milne is someone who can be developed, perhaps maybe by starting off on the practice squad. Don't know. Have to see him in a game first. Wright is in trouble. His progress plateaued in their eyes last season, and he lacks speed. He's going to have to have a good camp. Sims is clear, Stephen Sims is clearly in trouble. They were The team was bothered by his drops in 2020. I was a big fan of his entering last season, but injuries, again, curtailed his progress as well, and the drops lingered in the coaches' minds. Then they went out and got Humphreys, and they drafted Milne. Um, and with those two in the slot, in addition to Curtis Samuel and McLaurin being able to run routes there as well, and others who can handle the return game, S- Stephen Sims would have to show a lot to warrant a spot. Finally, the Jay-Z rumors. Burgundy blog mentioned the other day about Jay-Z's possible involvement in ownership here. I know J.P. Finley has been discussing this possibility on his podcast as well. What I know, they, the organization clearly has direct ties to Jay-Z's organizations through various marketing groups, crisis management, et cetera, crisis management, management firms, et cetera. Also, Dan Snyder wants to hit a grand slam with the new stadium. As he told TMZ, he wants to be better than SoFi out in L.A. They want it to become something that can be used hundreds of days during the year. This is a chance to not only build a stadium, but to greatly enhance the organization and create perhaps a mini empire and have different facets to the organization. You've got a football team and entertainment, whatever, stadium division, whatever. That's where I think Jay-Z would enter. It's hard to get minority owners now because they'd be paying a lot of money to have little say in an operation. There's no way a guy like Jay-Z is coming on board without having some sort of say. And he could end, he could help, he's not going to sit there and tell Dan Snyder, oh, get this quarterback or that guy, but he can certainly help in the rebranding and in trying to get this mecca built. If Washington wants to get back in in the into the district, for example, and the site of RFK, for example. The best way to make that pitch is by having something the city would benefit from many days during the year and not just a handful because they're going to look to benefit off that land on a, da- on a daily basis. So, but if you have, if you build, if these guys build what they want to build, you're going to attract the draft. You'll attract maybe the combine, you know, final fours, those kind of things. And I think that's the kind of stuff they're looking at. I don't think it'd be a dome stadium, but if you if you were going in that direction, then you could do something like what Arizona did or something like that with a retractable roof. I don't know if that's what they're going to do, but this is just kind of extrapolating and, and going down this path. Again, Jay Z can help here with who and what he can attract. I mean, there's a lot of gravi- gravitas when when he's involved, of course, and and of course, I think you know, and obviously Beyonce. Um, I don't know if this is going to happen or not, but if it does. It's not just to have him be a silent partner who just wants to be part of a team. No, it's to help the organization truly build something grand. Now, let's see if it happens. Anyway, that's all for me. I'll be back after this break with BYU passing game coordinator and wide receivers coach Fessy Sataki. We discussed Dax Milne and what he saw from him at BYU that makes him excited about his prospects for the NFL. This show can be found on Podcast DC, the new local app with hundreds of options in local news, health, and, of course, of the DMV region. Download the Podcast DC app to hear all the Empire shows as well as the other great content. Hey, everyone. I want to tell you about a fun new offer from Monkey Knife Fight that can enhance any sports experience, whether you're at a game, on your couch, or in a bar. It's a daily fantasy sports league that is easy to play. You can sign up on monkeyknifefight.com using promo code JKR and play games such as more or less. Will an NBA player score more or less than a listed point total? You can do the same in baseball. Will a pitcher have more or less strikeouts than a given amount, etc.? It's fun. And every Friday, it's home run derby. Bet on three guys who had home runs that night. All three hit one, you share in the prize pool. Every week, you can participate in their Eagle Eye jackpot based on the PGA Tour. Choose from any sport, from NASCAR to UFC and League of Legends. And, of course, 
Once football rolls back around, there will be even more fun prop bets. This is daily sports betting designed for the average fan to use their knowledge and have some fun. Sign up now at monkeyknifefight.com and use promo code JKR. That's promo code JKR. Welcome back. Now here's BYU coach Bessie Sataki. What I really want to do is kind of paint a picture for what, for Washington fans, what they're getting in various players. So for you, you've been around Dax, you know Dax. What is Washington getting in Dax Mill? Someone who absolutely loves the game of football, who's who's dedicated his life um, in, into the game. The guy, the guy's the most competitive person, you know, I've coached, and he loves playing wide receiver. Um, he's a guy every single week that just looked to find ways to, to perfect his craft, and I'm just super proud of him. He plays with a chip on his shoulder and, you know, coming in as a walk-on that's and getting to where he's at right now, that didn't just happen. Um, that, that came through a lot of perseverance, um, feeling that motivation, that chip on his shoulder. And, and I think I think Washington fans are going to love everything about Dax. When you say he's the most competitive person you've coached, why do you say that? Every single opportunity where there's, where there's um, a chance to compete, um, he makes it clear that he's he's competing. You know, there's there's drills we do. There's I mean, the game takes care of itself. Everyone kind of is ready right. is up for a game. But in practice, when it's one on ones or when it's in the weight room and, and guys are lifting or when it's just a little drill in practice or or even in the off season, any chance where there's where there's something to compete, um, even in our meeting rooms and we have little games, you know, I'm, I'm trying to have a little fun and give these guys a break and. You know, a guy like Dax will turn it into a competition. Just any any time he can compete, he's ready to do it. Do you have a favorite memory from one of those games where I mean I have I, I have kids. I remember some games we play where there you see their competitiveness and I still laugh about them. Do you say have something like that with Dax? Um just I would oh, oh you're saying like a little game? Yeah, just like did you have like some of the games you guys would play where you kind of like, wow, he really is that competitive, where you just kind of saw that jump out and something where maybe you laugh about later. It's more nothing specific, just more like he'll be the first one in the meeting room to just start laughing and poking fun at someone because of an answer they gave just because he wants to, like, get guys' juices flowing a little bit. <laughs> so he's just always hey, you can count on Dax to make fun of someone or to, or to make a joke to get guys kind of get get under their skin a little bit. And I, re- I saw something where you one time said he's um, obsessed with the position with with his craft. How did you see that? The times I would look out the window in the off season and see him out there on the field alone, just training. Um, when I would be in the meeting room and I would cover something, I would say, hey, here's a new technique we're going to use this week. Or, you know, here's a new adjustment to this play we're going to do. And then I go to the practice. We go to the practice field. He's the first guy in the line every time. And he just right there nails exactly what I wanted to get done. Whereas a lot of guys I have to kind of plan on re- reteaching it or or you know, echoing whatever I said. And so just he's time after time, he's proven that um, he's able to retain things and implement exactly what you're talking about because he really just thinks about football nonstop, 24-7. He's just got this natural feel to the game and to the position. And just the more success he sees, the more he continues to to, to kind of flourish in that regard. And when you'd see him out there working on his, on his own, like – you know, some guys can go out there that maybe they don't always know what to be working on. They're just working. So what little things would you see him working on that kind of showed you that he's going above? He's not just out there working. He's really trying to improve. Yeah, if that makes sense. I, yeah, it does. Absolutely. He would do a lot of things um, where he would work on transition, getting in and out of his break, which is funny because that's a major strength of mm-hmm. his. I win one on one routes by how I by how I run my routes. I really get open. But you know what? I can still get better. I'm going to get even better at those and, and create even more space when I run routes now. And I think a lot of that you can attribute to his self-awareness. He knows what his strengths are, what some of his limitations might be, and and whether it's a weakness or a strength, just continues to perfect his craft. So I would see him all the time setting up cones, running routes, getting in and out of his breaks, and just trying to, trying to keep perfecting that. And how did you see, like, he came in as a preferred walk-on. Did he surprise you by where he got? I know. You, did you recruit him before? Because you, you were yeah, at Weaver State, right? Yeah. So correct. Yeah. So so you get him here as a preferred walk on. You you knew that he could play because you'd recruited him elsewhere. But how surprised are you? He went from that to now this. I'm not I'm not surprised to be honest. I I I thought I was getting a steal when I was at Weaver State. He was he was mm-hmm. ready to come to Weaver State. Um, 
And so in one week, I was wearing purple talking to him about how we could feature him in Weber State's offense. And literally uh, the next week, I'm, I'm in a blue polo talking about how we don't really have scholarships left. We are in a time crunch. And he's got to he's got to um, trust us and he's got to know that I trust him and will give him every opportunity to, to get on the field and potentially earn that scholarship and credit to him and his family, you know, and trusting him um, and trusting the process. So to see him come in, like I knew he had the skill set to just continue to be great. One thing that shocked me the most is how we continue to develop physically. Mm. You know, I, I, I um, he was probably 5'11", 175 when he got in. And now he's 6'1", 195, and he was totally fine. His size, I would have been fine if he stayed that size because um, he was such a precise route runner. He was so good at what he did. But the fact that he was able to just get more broad, broader shoulders and stronger and faster and taller was just an added plus. And so as, as you started to see him grow physically and mentally, um, intellectually in the game, you knew that he was gonna he was gonna have a shot to to play at the next level. So when you started to see him grow like that and get bigger, how did that manifest itself on the field in terms of his play? Just more confidence, his ability to to use not just have to use his quickness in a route. Now he could he could body guys up and and be strong. Um, the way he was blocking downfield, maintaining blocks, and taking pride in fin- finishing with physicality, like. You could see that that confidence was exuding as he just continued to uh, physically develop. Do you see him being more as a slot guy in the NFL? I, I wouldn't be surprised if that's what they feature him more at because he's got such a feel of, um, you know, he has spatial awareness and a great feel of defensive coverage, um, can change routes depending on what guys do. He's a great reactionary player. But I played him a ton on the outside. That's what he mainly played. And I wanted to do that because not only was it for the betterment of our team, but to show he's an outside receiver, he can go up and win the one-on-one matchups. And so I, I can see, I wouldn't be surprised if they played him at slot, but I also wouldn't be surprised if they, if they kind of just move him all across the board. Cause I think he's, he's able to do that. Why do you think he would be, especially cause I think they probably would put him inside. They have some outside guys, you know, and they I could see him the developing, maybe him for a role inside in a year. Adam Humphreys is here. But what would make him a good slot receiver in the NFL, do you think? You know, there, I think there's a lot of – I mean, offense is very and, – and, but just speaking generally in, in West Coast terms, there are a lot of plays at the slot where, where you're, re, you're going to have to read things on the fly. And, and I call them – sometimes they're diagram route runners. They're guys who are just going to run the route that's on the diagram. And then there's times where you have to really implement a feel and a slight adjustment to your route. And that's what happens more often than not, I think, at – um, especially at the college and and at the professional level. And Dax has this natural feel that you just can't coach um, and mm-hmm. he's able to do that. And and that happens a lot more at the slot, obviously, because because most of the times you don't have that cornerback right in front of you. And so I, I, I feel that's why he would thrive. Um, one of the reasons he would thrive at the slot. He was surprised that he left. And is it is that more of an example of him, again, kind of betting on himself a little bit here? Yeah. Yes to both of those, you know, surprise, not so much because I didn't think he should have um, just because it was, it was my little walk on project that I brought on. That was, that was <laughs> the next, you know what I right, mean? And, right. and so it was more, it was, a, it was a sting in that regard, but as, as you let things settle, I was so, so happy and so proud and very supportive of his decision. And, and um, you know, I, I, I just think he's going to, he's going to do a great job. I'm super, super excited for him. What do you say? What would you say? Okay. He's, He's developing here. He's still got to get a little bit better over here. What are some things like that? Yeah, I think, I think honestly, just continual knowledge of the game of football. He definitely understands it. You know, a lot of the things he does reactionary are because of that feel I'm talking mm-hmm. about. But as he, I think one thing he's just going to continue to get better at, and I'm confident he will, is really mastering defensive, um, you know, coverages, adjustments, um, alignments by the defenders, what that means, pre-snap stuff. He's got a good feel of that, but I think that's something he's going to continually get good at. And I know those guys are, are going to, you know, help him help him get to that point at the next level. How do you think, like, just because his dad was in a different sport growing up and all that, but he kind of followed a similar path. How do you think that that family dynamics maybe helps him to get to where he is now? I think it's been everything. You know, Dax's family, he's got an incredible family. Um, you know, Darren, his dad, was a, is an athlete. He gets it. Um, he's very hands-off. Um, in his approach to his guys, but when he needs, I think when he needs to get in those guys, he, he does. And you can tell he's an unbelievable father and his mom, Jill is the, is the, she's a sweetheart. She's a warrior, obviously a, a cancer survivor. And, and to see, right. to see her go through all that and to see Dax handle all that. That's such a, 
such a pivotal stage in your life, being in college and, and being on the stage Dax was on, to be able to manage those emotions and to stay true to who he is at his core was so cool to see. So it's his family's everything, the way they are and how they've raised him. It's it's why he is the way he is. And that happened with his mom. It was a couple, I think it was what, 2018, I think that was. Yes. So yeah. how how because that's when he starts to blossom. I mean, that's for a kid that age to see your mom going through this while still trying to get improve over here is not easy. And it's, I mean, both of them are very difficult things to do and accomplish. How did you see him handle that whole situation? And how does that contribute to maybe, maybe just a different maturity level too? Yeah, that's what it was. It, it, Dax was forced to be put in a situation where he had to understand perspective and realize that, you know, where this is a time, a lot of people are just having fun and parting their life away. He really um, had to had to buckle up and, and ask himself, what is my why? And that doesn't mean you can't have fun in college and all that stuff. But he really I think some of those decisions he made, those sacrifices he made where maybe he didn't, you know, go hang out and and, and I want to go to the field and perfect my craft or, or buckle down and do, do this uh, this homework assignment. Those are things where where flashes of his family and his mom would probably pop through his, you know, his head and made those decisions, um, you know, much easier to make. So I think I to see his maturity and development through all that. It was a learning. It was a learning experience for me. I think a lot of the guys on the team really gravitated towards him, really respected him for how saw saw him growing and seeing success and realized that, you know what, our hands shouldn't have to be forced to put things into perspective and to, and to learn sacrifice. We can learn through some of our teammates and Dax was one of those guys. And so it's credit, credit to him, how he handled that. And I'm just great, grateful his mom's doing awesome. Now. Right. And, yeah. That's good to hear. Yeah. Yeah, it was. And and, and I, I would imagine, too, like during that time, did you ever see him have a again, it's natural to have a difficult time with watching your mom go through this. Could you tell how it weighed on him or could you just see more? He's just I'm just going to pour it into this and not let it, you know, I don't want to say distract because it's your mom, but I'm not right. going to you know, I'm going to use that as motivation to keep pushing forward. Did you ever see him have, you know, have to kind of pause and did you have to nudge him a little bit or was it just all on his own? I never had to nudge him, but you could see him wearing, you could see him wearing the stress and the gravity of that situation. But, but to his credit, he never let it affect his performance. You could see it on his demeanor at times. Um, and I'm, I'm glad because it showed, he showed he cared and he was vulnerable. But the thing that was awesome is it never phased the, him in the way he, he, he cared about his business. How cool was it to get on the scholarship? Oh, it was awesome. It was just, that's why you coach right there. I mean, the, the, the best part of coaching is giving a kid a scholarship. The worst part is 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 taking those scholarships away, you know, and right. seeing a guy let that see that scholarship slip out of their hands. And so um, on that whole spectrum, though, that's why we do this. So I was, I was so um, delighted to be able to see his reaction and, you know, the tears and, and the smile on his face with all the hard work paying off. And he knew it wasn't the end, but it was just the start to something that was going to that was going to be a great journey. It's also validation for a guy, for a kid's work, but I'll be honest. I, I think those are my favorite videos from college, the scenes where a guy is yeah. being awarded a scholarship. It's because you know that this guy had to put something extra into it to, to do that. And you, and you, you have to earn the respect of the coaches and the players and all that. What do you, what else, what do you remember about telling him that was, it, you know, what, what was that like, even for you as a coach and just that whole moment? It was just, it was a very, it, it was an intimate setting, which is which is how I, I like it. Um, you know, I, I think those I agree with you, by the way, those team settings, they're awesome. And yeah. I think the reason why people get so excited about that is they're reminders that these guys are, are playing the game because they love it. Right. They're not hand, they're not handcuffed to the game because of a scholarship. The scholarship doesn't run them. These guys do it because they love the game. And those are good reminders. And so I think that's why there's so much genuine, pure emotion when guys are awarded scholarships. But. I just remember the setting with Dax, just one on one after a practice, being able to tell him and just give him a hug and embrace him and let him know that he's just going to continue to get better. And it's just one of those memories I'll, I'll always remember. I'm grateful, grateful I was a part of that. That's cool. Last thing here, Fessing, I appreciate you joining me. So, does Zach Wilson go number two without Dax Milne? <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, man. I, you know, Zach's going to be the first to probably say yes because that's yeah. how he is. He said he can't, do it, he can't do it with anyone, and that's a credit to Zach. And I think the same thing could be said about Dax, you know, going because yeah. of Zach. And that's sure. just the way the game should be. I think I think the more we open our minds up and, and give credence, you know, where, you know, give credit to other people and all that stuff, that's 
that's what makes our team so awesome and special is guys aren't afraid to say, hey, I wouldn't be here without you. And so um, I think those two would both say that about each other. And and with with Zach, he's obviously going to a tough place to play in the, yeah. with the Jets. Haven't had a lot of success there. And he's going to be the guy. What about his makeup do you think makes it makes him be able to work there in would will me be able to make him work there in New York? In his mind, Zach is the greatest quarterback in the NFL. And I and I and he does it in a way where he exudes confidence, but he has humility to him. And I, I think that that confidence allows him to shut off that noise as much as you can being in the position that he's in. And I know that that's hard to do, but I'm so confident in Zach. I will always bet on Zach Wilson. I'm so excited to watch him grow and flourish as, as a, as a player and as a quarterback um, in the NFL. And I'm, I'm super excited for him. What's the, what's the best quality that you see that, that you feel like he has? Is it just what you said or is there something else with him? He's the most motivated, driven, determined. You know, I, I, I have endless memories of Zach in college being in the film room um, 11 at night where we have to kick him out of the offices. And this is right after practice. So these are five hour film sessions he's having on his own. The guy is just completely married to the game. He loves it. He understands it and is, is driven like unlike any other. And so that that's, those are things that I just, that's why I know I, you know, he's going to be successful. And then last, anything else on Dax you want Washington fans to know? They're going to love him. He doesn't say much. He's a very quiet, type of guy who just goes about his business but when you crack that shell open get ready because you got some personality like that that's what i love about the kid is he's he's very just you know to himself um but when he hits that stride and when he starts to feel comfortable there's an unbelievable human being there and, and that's just who he is i love the guy and i'm, I'm super excited for him Fessy, thank you very much appreciate you appreciate the interview thank you thank you john take care enjoy your day Hey, DC sports fans. We are the Beltway Sports Bros. I'm Matt Vizana and my brother, Noel. Hey, Noel, this is where you talk. Matt, are you sure I should be talking? You know I can't handle this censored bullshit. Settle down, Noel. We're just fans like you, talking all things DC sports every Tuesday and Friday. And check out our top five Fridays and all our awesome guests. Like Doc Walker, Mike Jones, Ben Standig, Bram Weinstein, and many others. Subscribe to our show wherever you get our podcasts and check out all of the great shows from Empire Media. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Fessy for joining me and thank you as always for listening. I'll be back with another episode Sunday night. Talk to you next time.